Glory to God. Go ahead, the rest of you, and open up to Matthew 16. And that probably, we pop up, pop up, and then Nathan had to do something with school today uh, that was required. And uh, we're hoping there won't be a whole lot of these Sunday kind of issues, but glory. Amen. But he's in college. Things happen when you get in college and start doing activities and being part of things. And, um, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're talking about setting proper priorities in life. We covered, first of all, our first priority is God. Our second is our spouse. Third is our children. We, these are, these are um, the order things must be in. And, but today we're going to talk about the church. It's the fourth priority of life. Now, why doesn't it come before your spouse? I'll let your wife inform you men when you get home why it doesn't come before your spouse. Hello, or men, uh, 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 women, I'll let your husband inform you. And you can't be down at the church eight days a week. And there's no such thing as that. Well, the Beatles thought there was anyway, so. Um, you can't be at church eight, uh, seven days a week all the time and then expect your marriage to be in good shape because you're not even spending time together because one of you is at the men's thing, one of you is at the women's thing, two of you on uh, different boards and you're, you know, you're cleaning the church or you're singing it and you're pri choir practicing or whatever, all that kind of stuff going on. Um, church has its role and church has its place, but it doesn't come before you. So you gotta, you've got to set a aside priority so that God is first, your spouse is second, your children are third. You can't be so involved in the church. Let me tell you something. You can't be so involved in church, you can't be at your sons or your daughters' uh, concerts, athletic games, school events, things that are important in their life. You've got to be there. Right. Amen. Well, I can, you know, and I'm going to tell you something. If you're always at church and never there, now you've got to find a balance. I understand there's a balance. You know, I mean, there's times that, that I had to leave my son's ball games because I had something going on at church that I had to be at. But I'm telling you, he knows that if it was at all possible, and I was there, I was there all the time. I would drive all over the place to be there for his, his, his games, especially in, in school ball. Um, I was always traveling and going down, rushing back to get back for Wednesday night services, which they usually didn't have a Wednesday night game if something came up weird. But sometimes I had RMEI events going on that, I, that were planned months in advance. They scheduled a game that I couldn't miss the RMEI event. And um, that's when he hit the home runs, and that's when he hit the doubles, and, and I did all the stuff that I wasn't there to see. I was like, can't you just at least do something when I'm there? <laughs> you know, I get text messages. I think his senior night, he was, he was 0 for 2, his first two at-bats. He hit two doubles right after I left. <laughs> so, son, can you not do it while I'm here? Hallelujah. But, you know, your kids need for you to be involved, and, they, you know, and you find those balances in life. And so, um, well, you know, I have, to, I have to pray six hours a day. Well, you know what? If your kids need you, they need you. And you may just have to take your prayer time and stay at the middle of the night if that's what you've got to do. Because you've got to be there for them. Because you only have a certain number of years. I kind of, remember number three was your children. Uh, you only have your children in your home a certain number of years, and then after that, it's over, and uh, you can pray all you want to. But you don't want to do damage along the way. Uh, the, the old terminology, PKs. Y'all heard, you know, they're a PK, they're a preacher's kid. Well, a lot of times that was a negative term because, I mean, now my kids think it's a great term because they love being a PK. But, um, you know, a lot of kids grow up hating the ministry, hating God because their parents were so busy about the things of the church, they didn't have time for their kids. We cannot be busy about, so much busy about life that we forget about our kids. That being said, let's talk about the fourth priority, which comes after your children, is, is the church. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, this, uh, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, which is a pebble, it's, it's Petros, it's not Petra, it's Petros. It's a small stone. The church was not built on Peter. And upon this Petra, boulder, I will build my church. Now, Jesus said this right after uh, Jesus asked the disciples, uh, uh, who do men say that I am? Some say that thou art Elias. Some say that thou art John the Baptist, one of the prophets raised from the dead. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto Peter, he said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, Petros. Um, you have my right Greek words on my brother Bill. Okay. Pebble. Pebble. Small stone. And upon this rock, Petra, boulder, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He was not saying he was going to build the church on Peter. He used two different Greek words. If he was going to say the same, if he was going to say it was on Peter, he would use the same Greek word. Amen. Or he would have just said, and upon you I'll build my church. But he didn't. He used two different words, 
And in what he was referring to, the boulder is the rock of the revelation of Jesus being the Christ, not Peter being the first pope. Now, I mean, this, this, you, can't, you can't take and change the Greek words to make them fit what you want them to fit. They're two different words. They mean two different things. One means a stone, a pebble. Um, the other means a boulder. Jesus said, I'll build my rock, build my church. He's going to build his church. Jesus believed in the church. Can you say amen? amen. The church is what Jesus came to develop and build. The church can be many things. It can be the house or the building we worship God in. And I will show you from Scripture that is true. You can see, we charismatics, we get so, some people get so, whatever, we're not going one Scripture, don't study the Bible, and then run off with all these things. And I don't need to go to the church. You know, that's not the church. I'm the church. Well, there is truth in that, and there is error in that. Because when they say that, they're usually implying they don't need to assemble themselves with the other believers. But I can show you from Scripture that Paul referred to the house that people met in as the church. And he also referred to the people in the body of Christ as the church. In other words, we individually and collectively make up the church, but also there is a meeting place that's referred to as the church which is the assembling of the saints. And I will show you from the scriptures we read today that that meeting place and that assembling the, together of the saints was a vital and intricate part of early Christendom and, and, and their, their functioning and operation. In other words, it was the central social and, and spiritual uh, gathering of the saints. It was core to their uh, activity and existence. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus said he's going to build his church. Um, Acts 7.38. I'm just going to read some scriptures. We'll put them up. You can write them down. Referring to John the Baptist, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles unto us. I'm not, not John the Baptist. Um, had to be Moses. Uh, Acts 11, 22, these tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Verse 26 of Acts 11. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass they, uh, the, uh, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I love this. Christians, meaning Christ-like or little Christ. But they weren't Christian because they went to a building that claimed it was a Christian church. We, we have the debate now going on in our country. What is a Christian, you know? Well, if you belong to the such and such church, you're a Christian. No, if you belong to such and such church, you belong to the such and such organization. But are you born again? Have you passed from death unto life? Is Jesus your Lord? Because if you're not born again, you're not, you're not a Christian. Well, I signed the roll book. Well, I joined the mailing list of, of Macy's. It don't make me a Macy's. <laughs> Hello. No. Signing the roll book. I mean, look, being water baptized, taking first communion, shaking the preacher's hand. None of those things make you born again. You have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. Amen. Communion doesn't save you. It is something to listen. I know there are churches that teach, you know, and ask, you know, the transfiguration of the elements into the actual body and blood of the Lord. That is not biblical. It was symbolic. It's always symbolic. Symbi Jesus took the institution of Passover and, and, and said, it, referring to him as the, the Lamb of God, it was his body and his blood. It was symbolic. It does not literally become the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just error. There's no, there's no biblical way to sustain that other than somebody got a revelation. Well, I, I, I'll take Bible over your revelation. Now, um, for, uh, Acts 12, 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Uh, Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, and which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Acts 14, 27. And when they were come, they gathered the church together. 
and released all that God had done unto them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Uh, Acts 15, 4. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Acts 15, 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men to their company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, named Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Acts 18, 22. And when they had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Act, uh, Romans 16, 1. Boy, can y'all keep up with this? I'm, a, I'm like a... Uh, I commend unto you Phoebe our sister which is a servant of the church which is at uh, Kentra at Romans 16 5 likewise greet the church which is in their house Salute my well-beloved Epiditus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Romans 16, 23. Gaius, my host and of the whole church, saluted you. Eratus, the chamberlain of the city, salute you. And Quatris, our brother. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, Timothy who is a beloved son and faithful unto the Lord, who is to bring unto you remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, I've got a bunch of other scriptures we're going to read, or, or we, may, we may hit some highlights here. The, notice over and over and over again, everything keeps referring to the church. I'm going to read some scriptures here. They're talking about churches and people's houses. Paul will talk about uh, the church being the gathering of the people themselves. He'll talk about actually in one scripture uses, uses this, that we ought to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, which is the church. Then in another place he says, you know, that Jesus talked about his flesh, which is the church. You know, it's, it's, it, the church is a term used throughout scripture in the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts and the epistles. We have a lot written about the church, the assembly, the, the gathering, and the place that they meet. It is core to us. I'm going to tell you something. You can't make it without the church. You need to be in the house of God. That is a biblical term. I'm the house of God. No, you're not. You might be the temple of the Holy Ghost, but you're not the house of God. The Bible doesn't use that term about you. It calls you the church. It calls you the dwelling place, but it says that their building is the house of God. Let's get our terms right and not get, because what happens was when people misuse terms, then they will misapply their application. And when they do that, they start coming up with flaky doctrine. Anybody, anybody been around flaky Christians before? Okay, let me ask you this question. Anybody ever been a flaky Christian before? Raise your hand. Yeah, Harold, Harold was honest. I, I always, I, yeah, hallelujah. I know Brother Bill was. All right. He repented. All right. We see that even in the letters that are written, that references are continually made about the relationship with believers and the church. They're gathering together. They're joining together. Um, things that, that are done are done through the church or in the church. Understand it's imperative Do you have a relationship with a church. You need that. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. You know, well, you know you're going to be weird. <laughs> you can't find you some minister somewhere and he'd be your favorite minister and you just sit at home and listen to their tapes and watch their YouTubes and, and send money to them and you don't have anything. That, you, you're going to have to learn to deal with people. Amen. And you're going to need other people. Because I tell you, you get yourself into some islands, you become a narcissist, you'll become a lunatic, you'll become crazy. You know, you say it with a Spanish accent, crazy, loco, a loco, hey, you know. You, you cannot live as an island unto yourself. You need other believers. Uh, uh, iron sharpens iron, the scripture says. And if you can't learn to get along with Christians, how are you going to get along with sinners? Unless... You want to act like them. All right, all right. That one, I said, I just turned around so you could shoot me in the back. God didn't call us to act like sinners. Do you remember back in the book of Acts when trouble came? What does it say? And they went unto the sinners and hate with them. Okay. No? What Bible do y'all read? Y'all read the King James? How about the 1611 KJV? Ooh, 
Oh, yeah. I mean, the one woman told a preacher one time, said if the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it was good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. 1611 King James was written. Paul died about, you know, 60 or 70 A.D. Yeah. He did not see, die 67 C.E. He died 67 A.D. He did not die in current era. He died in the year of our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Paul would say, the, not Paul, but the book of Acts would say, and when the pressure came, said they went to their own company. So your company is important. Your life, your life having a, 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 a uh, revolving interest, when I say revolving, I mean, you know, you're, you're spending time doing things you do in life, but then there's always this, this constant thing in your life called the church. It's a constant. It's a consistency. It's where you go to get fed. It's where you go to get sharpened. It's where you go to have for fellowship. It's where you go for encouragement. Now, I know you're supposed to have a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. That, that was our number one priority. I understand that. I know you have your spouse and your children. But you see, the church is, a, is an important part of your life. The saints gathering together. And whether you want to call the building or the saints gathering together, the, the fact is you've got to gather Hello, somewhere. If it's in the parking lot under, under a, a first up shelter, it's still the gathering of the saints together. If you see here, Paul did, you know, over and over again when he was writing, he didn't refer, or Peter, and the, the, well, actually Luke here, but, but many times it was Paul speaking or different you know, people in the, in, the, in the book of Acts. When they made reference to things, when they went to places, when things took place, when activities took place, it was with what? The whole church, the church, the church, the church, the church. I gave you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, about 12, 12 passages of Scripture uh, just then that refer to that. I've got about 30 more I can read to you. Of how the church is integral in the life of, of Christians. You need the church. You need to come to church. You need to sit down under a pastor and be submitted. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says that, we're, that you're to obey those with the rule over you that, you that they may give an account of your soul with joy. You don't want me going to the Lord saying, I'm going to tell you something, Greg was nothing but a pain in the backside. <laughs> Hello. I mean, you had so-and-so in my church, and they, they were a constant thorn in my flesh. Because they bucked everything. They wouldn't submit. They wouldn't obey. They were just hard-nosed. And they'd run out and say, I don't have to obey. I'm under grace. Well, the Bible says to. How can you not have to obey if the Bible says to obey? Amen. Well, you know what they're doing now? I think Peter wrote that. Obey those with the rule of you that may give account of your soul with joy. There's people out there saying now, you don't, don't read Peter. Don't read James. Don't read John. Because they disagree with Paul on the subject of grace. And the only subject in the Bible, the New Testament, is, uh, is grace. So you don't read behind them because they contradict Paul. Therefore, it's not, they're not scriptural. I'm, I'm not joking you. Well, yes, it is. It's doctrines of devils, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, winds of doctrine tossing the children to and fro. That's exactly what that is. No, the Word of God says obey those with the rule over you. See, th you know, a lot of people don't want to go to church because they don't want to be submitted. Yeah, that's right. They don't want to be submitted to an authority. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like Pastor Ed. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm a likable guy. Mm -hmm. I haven't even got where I like me. Hey. <laughs> you know? I mean, I kind of think, well, you know, you're a pretty nice guy. Pretty nice. And, you know, and it's amazing how many people like me that don't go to the church. But some people come to our church, they'll get mad, they'll walk out. I had somebody who used to go to our church one time and, and saw somebody else was going to our church and walked up to me. I want to tell you about Pastor Ed. And the only thing I did today was counsel the girl he was dating and stop sleeping with him. <laughs> Hello. Well, <laughs> duh. I mean, you know, you're mad at me over that? I would have told you the same thing. Stop sleeping with her. You're not married. Well, what does that matter? Okay. Do we need to start from the beginning? Clearly. Yeah, I got mad at me because I, I told the, the woman to stop sleeping with him. If you love him, marry him. Otherwise, get out of his bed. Amen. 
That went over big. Well, you just don't understand. They're going to take my money, my government money away from me if I stop sleeping. We're called to live by faith, not by the United States government. Thank you very much. Well, you don't know nothing. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If anybody ever gets in my face and says, y'all don't know anything about being in poverty, I'll just send you to my wife. Okay? Janie grew up, and one of the houses she lived in, they looked through the cracks at the floor uh, at whatever's running under the house. They used to ride in their car and, and, and find rocks and stuff, and then riding down there, they would drop them through the bottom and turn around and see them bounce behind the car down the road because the, there was holes in the bottom of the floor of the car. It was a Flintstone mobile. They had one room. That, they didn't have central air and heat. They had a central room that had heat. One room they heated in their house. When they went to bed, they got next to the got next to that one that oil heater. Some of y'all remember the old oil heaters, freestanding oil heater. They would stand next to that oil heater, get real hot, and then run and jump in their bed and cover it and pull the covers over the top of their head. Because if they woke up in the morning with their head uncovered, they would have ice around their nose and, and, and stuff from being so cold. Don't tell me should we, you know, that my, my wife or at least my wife. I didn't grow up that way. My wife did. Don't don't ever don't ever tell her that she don't understand being poor. But it, you, don't, you don't sleep your way in, into prosperity and you don't live in sin because you can get more blessing or more givings from the government. You teach yourself out of it. We, we had a family in our church years ago and she passed away. But I'm telling you, before she passed away, we had taught her the Word of God and she had gotten out of the projects, gotten, gotten herself out of that situation and was living a regular normal life. Hallelujah without having to live under the control of, of, of an entitlement system. Amen. Well, I can't have love without... Yeah, yes, you can. You can do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pull Jesse Duplantis. All right. Say we love the pastor. Now, see, there's, there's your opportunity to find out if you're going to obey and submit or to be rebellious and leave. Because what I just said may have knocked you right upside the head. But you can't live... Certain things. And the church, the church is the place you're going to find that. If you're living by yourself, you can get all kinds of revelation. I have people come to me, the Lord showed me this, and the Lord showed me that. Well, <laughs> yeah, but the Bible says, I, well, I know, but the Lord showed me. The Lord don't show you stuff that he hadn't already written here. And that's why there's safety in the church. Because pastors like me, who follow the Holy Ghost, yeah. will stand up in the pulpit on a Sunday morning when you show up and read your mail. Amen. Amen. And I didn't have it pre-planned, and God didn't know, and I didn't know your name, and I didn't see you walking door and go, oh, I'm going to get them this morning. Yeah. No, I'm preaching, all of a sudden this stuff starts coming out, and it came out by the Holy Ghost. And he's trying to tell you, don't, don't follow the path of other people in the past who said who told him. Yeah. That's why the church is important. Why? Let's see here. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I hate it when I don't have scriptures written down and I want to use them. All, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. Tell me where that is somebody so I can read it real quick. I knew it was 2 Timothy 3. Let's see here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 17. All scripture. See, that's why you got to come to church. Because see, if you're staying at home and you're not spending time uh, around somebody who's speaking to your life, you know what scriptures you'll get? Anybody know what scriptures you'll get? Ones you like. Yeah. Now come on now, you know it. You know it's true. If you stay at home and isolate yourself, the only revelations and the only scriptures you'll feed on, meditate on, talk about are the ones you like. <laughs> and the ones you don't like or don't want to do, you'll have a special revelation they don't apply to you. One, one, one couple went to a pastor friend of mine, and uh, they came into his office and said, we're having, rela we're having uh, relationship problems. And he started talking to them, talking about three or four minutes, and figured out real quick they were living together. And he said, well, I think probably the problem is, the reason you have relationship problems is you're living in sin. Oh, no, pastor, we're under grace. That doesn't matter. Yeah. We're under grace, it don't matter? What do you mean it don't matter? Why doesn't it matter? So they had gotten a revelation. You can't get revelations outside the Word of God that, that don't line up with the Word of God. Now look here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by God. 
by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. Yes, we believe in the doctrine of the Lord. Get real spiritual, can't we? It's profitable for doctrine. Yes, I believe it. From Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. All the begats, the ifs, ands, and ors. I believe it all. Until it tells you to do something you don't want to do. It doesn't work that way, folks. Nothing in life works that way. You can't show up at work for 40 hours a week and get a paycheck and not do what they ask you to do. Now, Sandy runs a business, I know that. And if um, Luis comes in, and Luis just sits over there in his chair at his table and uh, listens to his iPod. Now, I'm going to tell you, she's, you know, she goes there a few times to see him sitting there. She might think the first couple times he's working on something or thinking about how to fix something. But if she sees that for 40 hours in a week, she's going to have a talk with him. Luis, mi amigo, I no pay you. You no know, you know work, you no know get pay. And Luis says, wait a second, you hired me. I have a job here. As long as I'm here, I should get paid. But you're not working. Well, I don't have to work. But you have to pay me. See, a lot of people approach God that way. They think that God's got to do for them whether they do what they're supposed to do or not. It doesn't work that way. You know? When something comes out of the Word of God, then that's why we need the church. You need to be in church. You need to be under a pastor who won't just tickle your ears. Who won't just sit there and blow wind up your skirt. Who won't tell you how wonderful you are and it doesn't matter what you do. God loves you. Yes, God loves you no matter what you do. That's why he sent Jesus and that's why there is redemption and that's why there is forgiveness available. But he doesn't, you know, the, you can't make the implication that it doesn't matter what you do. He still loves you and with the inference that it's okay to do what you do. And that's where people leave it. That's how they leave it sometimes. The church, the Word of God says that the Bible, the, all scriptures are profitable for doctrine, yes. But look what else it says it's good for. Reproof. I don't like that part. Nobody does. Does anybody like it when someone comes and tells you you're wrong and they're right? <laughs> Nobody likes that. There, there's nobody that enjoys somebody saying, you did that wrong. And you know they're right when they told you. Yeah. But you have me want to hear it. And see, a single hand go up saying, I wanted to hear it. Now, you may have to. Also profitable for correction. Wow. Now, that's two things that would be what some people consider negative aspects of the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. But those two negative aspects are for your benefit and for your help and your instruction and your, your, your molding, as it were, to be a solid Christian. And that's why being in the local church is important. And then the last thing it says, uh, and for instruction and righteousness. Amen. Instruction and righteousness. So we have what? We have two positives, two negatives, if, if you're taking worldly mindsets about this. I don't see reproof or correction as negative. I see them as necessary elements to keep you on the right track. Yeah, that's right. Hello? Now, let me ask you something. If I tell you, if I'm, if I'm a driver's ed teacher... Let me find. Now, I know Sandy has a heavy foot. She likes fast cars. If you want to let me use your, your Corvette again, I'll be glad to take it out for a spin. Well, I had, we had our van, our van over there getting worked on one time. Uh, somebody had leaned, come in our yard and, and butted up against the, the tailgate and just put a dent in it. And so it was getting fixed. And while it was getting fixed, I got, I got the vet. I got the Z6. So Nathan was playing ball. He had a ball game just down the road at, at, at Calvary from her shop. And so I went to pick him up to bring him home from the game. Of course, you know, they, they had to get outside the bus and mop the parking lot from all the other guys in the, van, in the bus looking out the window drooling because <laughs> Nathan's riding home in the vet. <laughs> that thing would be at 83 miles an hour coming down the interstate on ramp yeah. in second gear. I was told not to, to really push it because I'd be at 200 before I could turn around. But I was 83 miles an hour from the top of an exit ramp to the bottom, or on ramp, in second gear. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Now, I'm going to teach, but I'm going to teach Sandy how to drive when she's young. She's got bad, she's real heavy footed. I say, all right, now, here's what you do. You put the, you push the clutch down, you put your foot on the gas and floor it. And pop it in the first gear. You, no. That's not how you do it. Because you, you may lose your transmission in the middle of the parking lot. Or rip something all to pieces. You know, trying to get, you know, whatever. I mean, you didn't pop the clutch. I mean, just let off with it wide open in first gear. Now, even if you don't drop that out, if you're sitting in your garage, you'll go out the back wall. You have to be instructed. Or, you know, if that's how somebody's trying to drive a straight shift, you say no. There are things in the kingdom of God people try to apply. They try to apply grace wrongly. They try to apply faith wrongly. They apply, try to apply righteousness wrongly. And it needs to be corrected. Word of God's important. And you've got to come into a place that that can be done. I can hear from the Lord. No, you won't. Because if you're staying home, not coming to church, you're already demonstrating you're not hearing from the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. That's my imaginary choir that I have back here that tells me amen when you won't. <laughs> amen. You know, you, you, if you're staying at home and not coming to church, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hear when the Lord speaks to you at home about the things in the Bible. Why? Because you're already rebelling about forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. You've already rebelled against the word of the Lord there. Now, how are you gonna hear from heaven at home rebelling against His word to start with? Well, I don't like them people. They might you. I don't like them people. They may not like you. Right. What's that got to do with it? If you were nicer, they might like you. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? I'm going to say, here, here, here's, here it is again. He that wants friends must show himself friendly. Yeah. yeah. I went in there and nobody would talk to me. You show to them. Okay, let's go home. We'll see you all next week for Pastor Appreciation Day. I'm not doing a real good job of garnering up support for next weekend, am I? <laughs> Correction. When you're told you're doing it wrong. I mean, just flat out, it's wrong. You're, how many of you say your kids don't like that? You didn't like it when you were young. Nobody liked to get a test back from the teacher that said, you know, with all the red marks, they don't use red some places anymore because it's so demeaning to the children. They use purple. Yes. Um, they don't say fail anymore. There's a new term they use. Not passing. Because we don't want to break their hearts. If they did it wrong, we don't say it's wrong anymore. We say, if that's what you think is right, that's okay. Because we don't want to break their spirit. We don't, now listen, I, you know, I, <laughs> we take our children to play in, in youth sports when they're little guys, and everybody gets a trophy. Yeah. Because you can't let the guys who didn't do good not get a trophy. Yes. Bless their hearts. As a matter of fact, we don't even play to win. We don't keep score. Okay, if it's instructional league, I get it. If, you're, if it's instructional league, call it what it is. This is instructional league. We're just teaching the basics of the game. We're not teaching the win-lose aspect. We're teaching skills right now. Call it that. Just call it that. And say the whole purpose of this is to teach the skills of the positions and so forth. It's not, you know, they will move into win-lose uh, things later. At this stage, we're simply instructing on the techniques of how to do this and how to do that. Okay. I get it. That, that's fine. But then there comes a point in time, somebody got to win and somebody got to lose. Amen. And let me tell you, even in instructional, I've been in instructional leagues, somebody's keeping score. Yeah. Usually mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. We have created a society, and what's it got to do with church? Everything. We have created a society where everything has to be fair, everything has to be equal. And about the Constitution did not guarantee equality, it guaranteed the right to pursue. All men are created, created equal. Now, I did not say that they will achieve equality. Right. Big difference. 
We start out with an equal playing field as, as, as people. But you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit, pursuit, pursuit of happiness, not the right to happiness. Yeah, right. You're not going to be happy if you're shooting up. Yeah. And it's not my fault, my responsibility, as a, as a, and I'm talking about natural now, to, get, to fix it for you if you're going to shoot up. In the church, we come in, and somebody wants to be the head usher, or they want to be the head this, or the head that, or they want to preach in the pulpit, and if they don't get to, they get mad and leave. Well, God, if God didn't call you those positions, you don't get to do them. Yeah, right. That's it. You, you have to be corrected in your behavior and how you act. The Word of God will modify your behavior. Yes, yeah. right. Therefore, for be imitators of God as dear children. The Word of God is to imitate. You know, the Word of God says this, be not conformed. Go over, go over to Romans. See, the role of the church is imperative in your life. Mm -hmm. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body to living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, or this world. Now, the word conform comes from a Greek word that means to be fashioned or molded or shaped. Do not be conformed. Do not be fashioned, molded, or shaped to this world. But be transformed. The word transform comes from the Greek metamorpho, which we get our English word metamorphosis from. And so, so you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here we find out that the Word of God tells us that we are to be, have a, a, a change in how we do things. That we're not to be shaped and molded and fashioned according to the world. Well, what's the number one thing the world wants to shape, fashion, and mold you to? Self. Yeah. It wants to be all about you. Well, I mean, there's a lot of Christians who take that song we sing in the church and we call it, It's all about you, Jesus. And they go around and they start saying, It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me and my needs. You know, Lord, bless me, my wife, our two kids, us four, no more. Lord, my name is Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. And as long as we're preaching stuff about how you can have everything you want and how you can live without, uh, without any restraint and how you can have all the blessings of God, no matter who you're living with, who you're, what you're shooting up, what you're smoking, what you're drinking, oh, hallelujah, as long as we preach that, people flock into the doors. But stop and tell people you've got to straighten up and walk how the Bible says walk, and they'll walk out the door. I'm at I'm, I'm, I'm the grace. <clears throat> you got this. I, I'll tell you. Uh, a couple of years ago, somebody uh, I saw this blog, and I and I got in on it. I just I cannot sit here and let this go out on the internet. And this girl said, "Oh, now that I found out the truth about grace, I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to submit. I don't have to obey. Oh, I'm so good to be free. You're not free." Paul said, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Jude, um, Jude says that people have crept into the church and have turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, the King James, licentiousness. And these both terms refer to giving into the flesh. Amen. Amen. You see, the imperativeness of the church where the Word of God is not only used for doctrine and instruction and righteousness. That's what people love. We love the doctrine. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me from sin. Oh, if I give, I'll have a hundred thousand fold return. Oh, glory to God, if the preacher comes in, I'm going to give up and I'm going to be rich tomorrow. How many tried that? How many got it? That went over. We love the doctrine of I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. I love the fact that I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Well, not your flesh. You're spiritually reborn. You're born again. But your mind's got to be renewed and your flesh has got to be buffeted. Paul did not say, I buffet my body daily. He said, I buffet it daily. 
little, little, just a little play on the word there. But, you know, I, I mean, listen, if you want to go to Shoney's at breakfast and eat all you can eat and then go to Golden Corral for all you can eat at lunch and then go to the, the Lebanese steakhouse and get all you can eat for supper, that's called buffet in your body. Paul said, I buffet my body. We don't say this. I keep it under. Referring to a disciplinary action of his spirit in controlling the appetites, dictates, and actions of his flesh. Right. Where do you learn that? In the church. Okay. Hello. What? From doctrine, instruction, and righteousness? No, from correction and reproof. There is some instruction and righteousness involved, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to learn it through, through, through correction and reproof. This is unacceptable behavior, brother. Hello. You can't go around. We had a guy back in our, in our church we came out of in Greenville, and we used to call this guy Brother Lips. Because he wanted to go kiss all the women in the church. And, and, and I mean, he'd see Janie, he'd come after Janie, and of course Janie's five too, and he was about 6'3". And so she would duck through the crowd. He couldn't get to her. She just, just a, I'm telling you right now, she, 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 had, she knew how to do it. She could just walk right into people's elbows and get out of the way. And we finally, we had to call him off, you know, pastor and the staff, we called him off the side and said, brother, you, you got to stop this. You can't be going around just kissing everybody in the church. He said, well, the Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. The, you know, it actually says greet the brethren. You know, I found it real interesting. The only people he was greeting were the women. Yeah. <laughs> he just wanted to go lay a sloppy one on the women and say it was a holy kiss. No, that was a, that was a, a, a lusty kiss. And we and said, look, brother, the day they greeted each other, they kissed him on the cheek. Now, if you, see, if you go to a lot of Europe, uh, European countries today, especially like Italy, your Latino countries, if you go to Italy, when you go in, they will kiss you on the cheek. And sometimes it's real, you know, and sometimes right in the mouth. Uh -huh. And you're like, you're, you're, I mean, men. It's, you know, kiss, kiss, and then kiss. It's, and it's a culture. They don't, they don't mean they're homo or anything. That's not how they do it. But I tell you, if you go over there as an American and that happens the first time, they'll shake you up. <laughs> yeah. I'll just be real honest with you. You know, I mean, you're like... Well, let's take up an offering and go home or something. I mean, you're like, yeah, praise the Lord, you know, but it's culture. And, and so greet each other with a holy kiss. It was, it was a normal practice to greet the kiss on the cheek or whatever. And it was, it was, except it was just how they greeted each other. But Brother Lips wanted to use that as an occasion to the flesh. We had to say, no, brother, no, no, no. Today we greet each other with a holy hand. If Paul was writing that, he'd say greet each other with a holy handshake. That's what he would say, because that's how we greet each other. Or, or, or a holy hug. We, you know, somebody, you know, we'll grab their, shake their hand and give them a hug or whatever. You know, man hug. Y'all know what a man hug is, don't you? It's, it's, not like, it's not like women. It's like men, you know. Boom, boom. All right. You know, remember, you just kind of wrap your arms around and go, pat them on the back twice like that. That's cool. You know, football players can hit each other on the butt, and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> But you hit me on the butt, we got a problem. <laughs> All right. You go hit my wife on the butt, you got a bigger problem. All right. The scriptures are given to, for doctrine. There is doctrine. There's, there's doctrine in the Word of God. But it's also given to instruct in righteousness. How do you conduct yourself in the church? And we're going to have to finish this tonight. It also is given to reprove wrong and bad behavior. Now, Paul did that in 1 Corinthians when he said, I've heard that there's something among you that's not even named among the Gentiles that a man should have his father's wife. Let me put that in plain terms. This young guy took, took his dad's second wife, his stepmama, and had gone out and shacked up with her. Yep. And nobody in the church will say anything about it. They're under grace. They're under grace. It's okay. It don't matter what they do. God loves them. Paul said, here's what I'm going to do to that man. You're going to show up. I'm going to show up in the spirit. And I'm turning him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit be saved in the day of the Lord. What do you think about that, guys? So much for the grace preacher. Yeah. That it don't matter. He turned the guy over to the devil. Said, destroy his flesh in hopes that his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. <laughs> we don't have pastors like that anymore. No. 
Yes, we do need them. Yeah. Uh -huh. We need some summer yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love Lester Summerall. You're talking about a bull in a china shop for Jesus. I love C.M. Ward. C.M. Ward. Uh, years ago, C.M. Ward was on, on TVN, and uh, they were talking to him. He, he finally said, you know, Brother Ward had gotten kind of old with sit a lot. He had this kind of groggly, gruff voice. And they said, Brother Ward, so uh, we, we, you know, what's going on? He says, well, he says, the symbols of God must be on the pill. <laughs> And the host looks at it, because he, look, he got understand, he was birthed out of the original movement of the Symbols of God. He was a leader. He wrote something called the Pentecostal Evangel. I mean, he was like one of the most highly respected AG ministers there was. And the host said, what do you mean by that, Brother Ward? He said, because they haven't given birth to anything in years. <laughs> so we need, we need men like that. And so and in the church, that's why the church is important. So Springfield calls them in on the carpet. You, you know, you can't say that about us. Well, we, we heard this rumor that you said this, and, and, and we've come to our attention. Uh, uh, we want to know about this. He, he's sitting there on the, in the chair. They're all kind of looking at him to rebuke him and stuff. He goes, ha! It's amazing what a man will say under the anointing. <laughs> I know this because I was in a room with him, sitting with him with about 15 other ministers, and we asked him about the TBN thing, and he told us the backstory about being called in on the carpet. <laughs> it's amazing what a man will say under the anointing. The church has a role in your life not just to make you feel good, but to bring correction and instruction in your life, reproof in your life that p keeps you on the right track so you don't get um, into error and get off. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's needful for you. Now, our society, I, I brought children, child rearing, rearing into this earlier. Our society has taken a position that you don't spank children, you don't correct children, you don't inhibit children, because in doing so you constrict their freedom and you will make them, you're not going to let them be who they are. This is just a bunch of gooby gop cosmic humanism and, and, and secular, well, really, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it is cosmic humanism. Because uh -huh. they have to find their inner self, their inner God. See, it's just been repackaged in their different terminology. It's all it is. It's them, you know, you can't inhibit them. They've got to find out, you know, they've got to express themselves. And you can start studying all this cosmic, and all the stuff we're dealing with in our society today. Progressivism, postmodernism, uh, post yeah. cosmic humanism especially. All these things deal with breaking down all the barriers of life. So there is no restrictions on anything, and people just doing what they want to do because they've got to find their inner God. There is no God. You have an inner God. You have to find that. Yet the Bible says, he who spares the rod hates his child. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart. Hello? Everything is about breaking down the dorm. The next time somebody gets in your face with homosexual marriage and goes, Jesus didn't say anything about it. And he didn't say anything about child molestation either. Didn't mean he was condoning it. He didn't say anything about bestiality and didn't mean he was condoning it. Hello. Just because he didn't say something about it. No, he didn't have to say anything about it because it was already written. You'll see him. You've heard that it's written an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, what is it? He's bringing, he's bringing a different law into operation. But I say unto you, he that smiteth thee on the one cheek turns him to the other cheek. In other words, he began to institute the law of love in response to people doing stuff to you. The things he didn't mess with, or he didn't talk about the tithe, oh yes he did. He said, you pay tithe of cumin and mint and so forth. He said, these things uh, ought you to have done. Oh, he, he, he said, you know, he started talking about something else. And he said this, and these things ought you to have done and not left the other undone. He did not do away with tithing. So when Jesus dealt with stuff, the only time he dealt with something was to bring it out of one arena into another arena, and that was the law of love. If he didn't deal with it, it was still in force, so to speak. He came, I came to fulfill the law. In other words, I'm the last land. There's no more lands to be offered. But just because he didn't say men shouldn't sleep with men, that was already understood. You don't do that. Right. And you don't molest children and you don't sleep with horses. Right. Now, I know you're sick. You get groceries out. They just arrested somebody in Florida. Yeah. It was on the news. 
him and his mini donkey. This is the perverseness we're dealing with in society. We have to, the church has to be able to say this is wrong behavior. And you can't live this way. And you can't claim grace. But see, when you sit at home and don't submit yourself to somebody, you, will, it may, not be, you may not be in this extreme, but I can tell you, you're, you're setting yourself up so you could be. You need the church. You need a pastor to sit here in your life. I don't believe in pastors. I believe in house church. Well, if you'll go back and study the Bible, they had house churches only because they were just meeting there, they were getting started, and they were meeting there. As a, as a place to meet until they could get it going. And they were under extreme persecution. Many times it was underground, so to speak. And they were doing what they had to do. Right. Amen. Not every, some places talks about the church at such a, didn't talk about churches in somebody's house. In the churches in Asia Minor, when, when, Paul, when, when John wrote to the churches in the book of Revelation, those were established buildings and churches. They were not house churches. The church had grown. Now, I know I'm, I'm kind of majoring on this side. Tonight, we're going to come out and we'll read all these other scriptures, and we're going to show you some of these things. But I'm trying to say, there is an important purpose of fellowship, or, or in a koine fellowship, which is, you know, um, not, as, as Mark, Matt Beamer talking about, it's not, not just talking about eating. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about uh, sharing one another. Sharing one another's uh, issues, needs, problems. Being supports to one another. You need, you need other people. You need to be able to come to church and say, I've got two things going on this week. I need for y'all to pray for me. Yeah. Instead of putting it on Facebook and having somebody go, oh, God, whatever your will is for Sandy, if it's to just destroy her and make her bankrupt and drag her through the mud and through the flood, at least raise her up and take her back through the blood in Jesus. You know, you know there's some people you don't want to pray for you. You know who they are. How are you going to find out who they are? By going to church with them. And if you hate your brother who you do see, how can you say you love God whom you can't see? We got people who won't come to this church because they got people in the church they can't stand. It's more than crazy. It's demonic. You can't sit in the same room with somebody else. Because you hate them, or you're so, now they'll say, I don't hate them, I'm just mad with them, or you know, they did such and such to me. Yeah. And yeah. what did they do to you? How bad can it be that you can't walk in love? <laughs> so we'll just pack it and go somewhere else. Well, listen, the only problem is you went there. And you, if you don't take care of the issues in your life, you're going to take them in another church. And give yourself enough time, and you'll find people over there that you feel the same way about. Why? Because the problem is you're not submitted in obeying the Word of God, and you won't submit to wholesome doctrine to be changed. That's why, it's a, that's why the church is important. It's a life center. You get corrected. You get reproved. You get taught doctrine. You get instructed in righteousness. Iron sharpening iron. You need one another. We need one another. My, my, my. I need you. I need Aaron's and hers to lift my arms. Amen. In the battle. As the pastor. I, some, you know, some pastors think they got to do it all alone. And, you know, and I know it's, it's easy to get in that mindset. I'll just do it by myself. I don't want to tell anybody I need help because if I tell them I need help, they'll think I'm not a faith man. You know, I need help. I need people to hold my arms up. We need people to tithe and to give and to supply. We need people to work and to do and to go out. There's all kinds of things we need in the church that have to be done. It's a life center for us. And I tell you, the Word of God's changed your life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'll tell you, the reason Janice was still around here for Jerry when he got around to decide she was the right one. <laughs> I love to pick on you, brother. You don't just tease him, would you? Was well, because she wouldn't leave this church. She said that the church is too important to her. It was too valuable to her spiritual life. She wouldn't leave. Amen. So tonight we're going to go over these other scriptures. And I know, listen, this is more of a talk than it is, a, you know, a, I'm not a teacher like a Mark Brzee or a, you know, somebody like that who would come in here and teach you line on line about church and they give you all the Greek tenses. I'm talking to you as a pastor about your need to be in church, how important it is to your life. And a lot of times you may not see it. Or you go run into people who say, who don't see it. 
Or they'll tell you, the Lord showed them. I love that one. The Lord showed me. Well, I'll be honest with you. The Lord didn't show you book. I'm not interested. The Lord showed me I didn't have to. It wasn't necessary. He told me I could stay home. Really? Wow. Why are you something special? Are you the apostle to the whole church that you stay home and get everything because you don't need to be submitted because you have such revelation? Because he told everybody else to go to church. But you, special you. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. You stayed home and he, he showed up and gave you a new Bible. <laughs> What's it called? Well, I, I picked it up the other day when I was over at your house, and I saw it. it's called the Book of Self-Righteous Opinions. Yeah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. No, if he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as of the manner of some, that's what he meant. He didn't mean except you, because you can't get along with people. So we love the pastor. But you gotta, we got we to grab ourselves by the back of the neck sometimes and say, I got to be in church. Not just in the church, you need to be connected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many have found out that even in the business world, you make relationships and you'll do business with people even if their, their prices are, are higher or whatever because you've developed a relationship with the business owner or whatever. And you know that if you go in there, he may have a higher price structure than somebody else, but because you have a relationship with them, and you come in and say, well, look, I'll take a look at it, and may not charge you anything. May charge you half price. Why? Because you've got a relationship. There's something about being in a relationship with a local church that's different than church hopping. I like to go whoever's having revival this week. That usually means you don't want to be submitted. Because you can run from meeting to meeting to meeting and never be submitted and get blessed. Hallelujah. Did y'all take all the baseballs at the door and give them Nerf balls instead? <laughs> Just to make sure I didn't get knocked out on the way out today. Stand up. Praise the Lord. Father, we do thank you. We thank you that we're, we're venturing into understanding the need of the local church. That we do need to be corrected. That we do need to be reproved. We do need doctrine and instruction and righteousness. We need to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. We need the fellowship. We need the, 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 um, the, the joining together. We need to be around people who may be going through exactly what we're going through or something similar and knowing that I'm, we're not the only one who's isolated. We can, we, can, uh, we can be strengthened and grow and be blessed in Jesus' name. Uh, I was over at our RMAI meeting last, in the very beginning of the month, and uh, I'm telling you, start, pastors start talking, and I'm they were saying stuff, they were going through stuff I'm going through. Church-wise, growth-wise, financial-wise. I'm thinking, well, it's not, it's not that I've, I'm just a, a horrible, you know, pastor. I mean, people all over the place are going through that. Yeah. Churches are shut down everywhere. I mean, churches are just shut down. Well, we're going we're to believe God to stay up. Amen. Amen. We're going to believe God for, for income to go come. Amen. Money coming. <laughs>